Good morning, everyone. This is Will Leahy with SIFMA. This is the GFMA LEI uh, webinar. Uh, we're we're going to be uh, just starting a, a moment. I know that uh, some folks are are joining via the webinar. It takes a few minutes to uh, to fully spool up for you to join. So we're just going to give it about 90 seconds and get started. Thank you. So good morning, folks. Uh, we're still going to give it just another 30 seconds, but for folks that have joined, I uh, just wanted to uh, let you know that this is the GFMA uh, LEI webinar. Got a lot of great content on deck, uh, and uh, just give us a moment while, uh, while folks join. We'll get started in just a second. Thank you. All right, good morning, folks. We're going to get started. Uh, I'm Will Leahy with SIFMA. This is the GFMA LEI webinar. I uh, want to make you aware of two quick things. Uh, one, you could submit questions through the webinar tool, uh, send a question to the organizer. I'll get that and direct it uh, to the appropriate panelists. Second, we're going to have polls, so please pay attention to your screen. We're going to be asking you questions uh, during the webinar. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Robin Doyle who is the uh, chair of the GFMA LEI Working Group and is also a managing director in the Office of Regulatory Affairs at J.P. Morgan. Good morning, uh, good morning, Robin. Thank you, Will, uh, for that introduction and getting us set up here. Um, so thanks, everybody, for joining the webinar. Um, we've done many of these with our colleagues here at, at GFMA and are very happy to have quite um, a strong panel of people from the regulatory side and industry and the life community to speak with you today. Um, you can see on the screen the list of attendees, uh, sorry, the list of the panelists, my, my apologies. So we have Julia Ferraris from, from ESMA, Claire Rowley from the GLIFE, the Global LEI Identifier Foundation. We have Terry Brensman from Invesco, Jim Fertitta from Goldman Sachs, Eugene Ying from the uh, GMEI Utility. We have Brid McLean from the Irish Stock Exchange and Preetha Sharma from the London Stock Exchange. So thank you panelists for joining today. So Will, um, the, what we'd like to do to get this party started is we, we'd like to have a, a bit of an idea of who is on the phone today. So we're gonna do two quick demographic polls um, to, uh, to, to get a look at that. So, so Will, I think you've posted the first poll. You wanna give directions? Sure. Uh, so it's uh, pretty straightforward. You select um, one of the options, buy side, sell side, regulator, or service provider, or other, uh, just to let us know who is on the line. So uh, just uh, fill it out. I can see we've got you know about 50% have voted so far. We wanna get that up to about 65, 70 before I close the polls. We're at 60% now. Uh, just gonna get to, I'm going to wait till 70. All right, thank you. I'm going to close this poll, um, and we're going to we're going to show uh, what the participants look like. So uh, we've got a uh, high participation on the buy side, 29%, sell side, 19, 7% regulators, 25% uh, service providers, and 20% other. Um, so. That's uh, good. Good information to to understand who the audience is. Then I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna uh, share the second in the uh, our the list of our polls 
regarding uh, where where your customers are located. So this is uh, where are most of your customers' clients located: Asia, Europe, Middle East, North America, or other. I can see uh, we're up to 40% voted so far. Um, so let's just uh, just give it a moment while uh, while those. Uh, Oh, I'm up to 65%. Okay, seems good. Folks are uh, folks are familiar with this polling uh, um, functionality. Up to 70%. Just gonna give it three more seconds, and I'm gonna close and share the results. Um, so the the results of this uh, very interesting. We've got six percent from Asia or rather 6% customer clients located in Asia, 42% Europe, 1% Middle East, 43% North America, and 8% other. Uh, so some good demographic information to understand the audience. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to, to Robin. Great, okay, thanks, and thanks everybody for participating in the polls. It looks like we have a good, um, you know, broad spectrum of folks, both regionally and, and from the functions that uh, where people work. So with that then, um, I'd like to start this webinar um, by turning to Julia Farraris, who's a policy officer um, with ESMA. And of course, you know, ESMA um, is, is a critical driver of some of the attention that is being paid to, to LEIs uh, today. Um, it's interesting, this morning one of my colleagues actually uh, mentioned that over the course of the evening last night, over 5,000 LEIs were actually issued. We're up to about 620,000 LEIs at this point. So the, the growth there is pretty significant. And I, I would say pretty, uh, pretty with a lot of certainty due to um, the topics that Julia is about to speak to us on with respect to MIFID and EMIR. So Julia, right before we start with your presentation, will one more poll, uh, what we're interested to hear, and this will help you know, Julia uh, with emphasis uh, on her comments to the group today, we'd like to poll folks to understand, you know, what challenges you're experiencing with the upcoming Amir and MIFID LEI requirements. So, quick poll. And, and I'll just read the read them uh, to provide uh, a little bit of uh, uh, time for folks to uh, answer. What challenges is your organization experiencing with the upcoming Amir and MIFID II LEI requirements? Uh, lack of clarity as to when or for whom an LEI is mandatory. Challenges with reaching out to clients, delays at LOU in processing LEI requests or maintenance, um, unsure what to do when LEI is lapsed or no challenges. Uh, I can see we've got about 40% uh, answered, uh, have answered so far. You can, you can select more than one with this, this poll, so um, this isn't going to be a straight uh, percentage. Uh, and uh, I can tell you it's pretty interesting. Um, Right now, we're up to 55%. Because this takes a little bit more to read through and select, I'm just going to give it another four or five seconds for folks to respond. The polls are closing now. So if you get, I'm just going to get the last one or two folks who are still in the queue. And I'm going to close and share the results. So the results are interesting. Uh, you can see 53% of the participants indicated that there's a lack of clarity as to when or for whom an LEI is mandatory. 41% uh, in indicate challenges reaching out to clients. 14% uh, delays at LOU in processing LEI requests or maintenance. 18% uh, are unsure what to do when an LEI is lapsed and a lucky 10% have absolutely no challenges. Um, so I'm just going to hide this, and we'll go back to Robin and Julia. Great. So Julia, let's um, let's address that 53%, and uh, let you take us through the uh, for the next uh, 20 minutes or so the requirements under MIFID and EMIR. So I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Robin, and uh, thank you all for this um, insightful poll. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I was quite uh, surprised by the the outcome of the poll. I was actually hoping that uh, the lack of clarity uh, item uh, would have been uh, less uh, popular among the uh, suggested answers, but uh, I hope that I will be able to solve some of your uh, clarity issues with my presentation today. Um, 
so my presentation today will fo uh, focus on the uh, ALEA requirements under uh, MIFID and EMIR. Uh, I prepared a, a quick uh, table of content, uh, so it will be divided in three sections. Uh, first, focusing on scope and deadlines, so application dates for the requirements. Uh, then I would move to uh, a general introduction of uh, the uh, LEI requirements, depending on which entity uh, is subject to the requirements. And lastly, I will uh, discuss a few reporting scenarios that, uh, according to uh, our understanding, generated uh, more debate uh, among uh, stakeholders, uh, and uh, especially with a focus on the involvement of non-EU entities. Uh, so these are the three areas where, uh, of my presentation. Uh, starting with the first uh, item, so scope and deadline, you have here a table indicating uh, the key application dates and also the scope of the requirements, so which entity would be concerned and would need an LEI according to the regulations. I'm not going through each uh, and every entity listed in the table. What I want to focus is on the application dates, so uh, starting with the EMIR uh, revised technical standards. Uh, the technical standards on reporting when were revised um, after uh, a year from the reporting start date uh, to address some shortcomings uh, that uh, were identified uh, immediately after the reporting. So it was uh, to respond to some concerns uh, from uh, both the trade repositories and also the market uh, and the um, regulators to ensure that uh, the uh, data standards uh, and data definition uh, to be reported were clear enough and there weren't inconsistency in the reporting. The application date for this uh, regulation is expected on the 1st of November this year. So this is uh, really the last, uh, the last call uh, from the regulator side to uh, urge uh, for compliance. Um, in terms of uh, application date uh, and, and trades that are involved uh, with the new regime, uh, it's important to precise that um, the uh, EMIR technical standards and the uh, TR validation rules that are published on our website will be applicable to all uh, trades uh, reported under EMIR also the uh, existing ones, so any uh, subsequent update to uh, uh, an existing trade that was reported should also be submitted according to the new uh, standards, uh, and this is because updates can be on the on existing positions, so evaluation and uh, compression. Um, different is the case of MIFIR. MIFIR uh, regulatory reporting requirements, uh, in particular, the transaction reporting and the reference data uh, obligation will kick in on the 3rd of January 2018. Um, this, in this case, uh, we are only uh, talking about new trades uh, that are executed from uh, starting from the 3rd of January 2018. So anything, any trade that is executed before that date uh, would need to be submitted according to the old MIFID 1 transaction reporting regime. These are the two key application dates to keep in mind. I also inserted in my table a reference to the market abuse regulation, and that is because uh, there is a specific set of technical standards relating to the obligation to submit reference data that is identical to uh, the MIFIR technical standards on submission of reference data. And that is simply because uh, at the ESMA uh, side, we decided to implement these two uh, technical standards with the same uh, IT system, which would be the FIRS, the Financial Instrument Reference Data System. So uh, for that reason, we uh, ensure that also the information requested and the details requested would be aligned uh, among the two regulations. And what it is important to note to the use is that uh, even though with a limited scope of facility, already in place and appli applicable starting from uh, last year, from July last year. So uh, especially with respect to the obligation of issuers of financial instruments uh, to be identified with an LEI, 
uh, it's important to uh, note that uh, if the instrument is traded on a MIFID-1 regulated market multilateral trading facilities, though the issuer of this financial instrument should already be identified with an LEI. And this also includes non-EU instruments, uh, all the instru non-EU instruments that are already listed on EU uh, regulated markets, for instance. So with this clarification, um, I would move to the next um, item on, uh, on my presentation, the LEI requirements. Okay, so on the uh, LEI requirements, so there is a distinction to be made between the um, entities that are directly subject to the reporting requirements and the entities that are indirectly subject. So um, under MIFID, you have reporting entities, you have investment firm executing transactions. Uh, these are the entities that are directly under the supervision of the EU competent authorities and that uh, have uh, the reporting obligation. Uh, similarly, under EMIR, uh, all EMIR undertakings, according to the uh, level one definition, uh, would uh, be the directly subject to the reporting requirement, and this includes um, both financial and non-financial companies, but also individuals acting as business, uh, for instance, uh, sole traders. And um, all these entities are um, subject to the obligation to report and to ensure the quality of the, uh, of the data that is reported to the regulators. Uh, this entity can also delegate reporting to third parties. Um, in the case of EMIR, there is no uh, specific uh, restriction as to which third party to be using. Under MIFID, uh, there is uh, a requirement to use uh, only uh, registered uh, entities, so the so-called approved uh, reporting mechanism that uh, for the submission of the report to the regulators. Uh, so these are the entities that, are, that have the responsibility to ensure the quality. Um, there is also another set of entities that um, still would need to identify in the report with an LEI and therefore are indirectly impacted uh, by the regulations. Um, they, uh, I listed them all uh, in my slides um, here. I'm not going to go through each and every uh, entity right now, but this is just to give you the overview uh, of all the uh, entities that might be uh, envisaged uh, to have an LEI. So moving on to the next uh, slide, I now uh, let's start with the requirements for the entities that are directly subject to the reporting obligation. The requirements are uh, indeed more stringent uh, because we are talking about the, the entities responsible for the quality of the data. And um, for instance, the um, uh, this scheme is, uh, uh, telling you what would be the consequence of uh, uh, reporting uh, a, an EMIR or a MIFIR report with uh, the LEI of the counterparty, uh, sorry, uh, the LEI of the reporting entity as uh, last. So in both EMIR and MIFIR, we have a requirement for the uh, reporting entity uh, to uh, have its own LEI uh, duly renewed which means that uh, there is not only a one-off requirement to obtain the LEI code, but there is also a requirement for the reporting entity to keep its own LEI reference data up to date uh, by paying the annual maintenance fee that is requested uh, under the GLACE. So uh, in case uh, the uh, report submitted uh, either by the entity subject to the reporting requirement itself or by the delegated reporting entity. If either uh, of these entities does not have its own LEI up to date, the report will be rejected uh, by the MERTR or by the uh, competent authority uh, systems. So this would be a clear indicator from the supervisor side uh, on whether the obligation is fulfilled uh, or not. Um, again, 
this is a requirement that, that does not apply to the parties that need to be identified in the report and therefore are not directly subject to the requirements, but it only applies to the reporting entities and the entities that are subject to the reporting obligation. Just to make this point 100% clear because it was uh, very um, controversial as, as, a, as a point uh, in our requirements. So, um, moving on, unless there are questions on the renewal, I will move to the next requirement for the entities that are directly subject to uh, the reporting obligation. And that is the famous uh, no LEI, no trade rule. This is a, a novelty in the NIFIR uh, transaction reporting requirements. So it's not something that was uh, in Envisaged in the EMIR technical standards, the MIFI reporting requirements they put this rule uh, on, on paper, black and, and white, so there is no longer doubt as to what are the consequences for the investment firm that is directly subject to the requirement if it, this investment firm is not uh, reporting the LEI of uh, the client on whose behalf is executing the transaction. So. Uh, in, this is uh, not, not a new rule, it's something that uh, was uh, published in our technical standard back in September uh, 2015. And um, our briefing, uh, a briefing note that we recently uh, published uh, this month uh, simply um, clarified the message and put it in the, from the perspective of the client. So, hoping that uh, this message will also reach directly the, the client of the investment firms to make them aware that uh, if a client um, have arrangements uh, with an investment firm uh, and uh, um, an investment firm that is acting on its own instruction, he should, uh, the, the client should make sure that uh, the, um, the LEI is obtained before January 2018 if uh, it wants that the investment firm continue to act on, on its instructions or make decisions to trade. So this message has been um, clearly uh, sent and it was uh, merely repeating what uh, stated in our technical standards that was published in September 2015. So moving on to the next slide. Now we're talking about the uh, other entities that are, need to be identified in the report. In my earlier slides, I had uh, a full list of entities. Among them, uh, we have very important uh, entities like the issuer of the financial instruments, the clients, the beneficiaries, the brokers, the decision maker, uh, the CCP and the clearing members. Uh, I want to focus, uh, with this slide, I want to focus on two specific uh, set of fields that are in the MIFIR transaction report, uh, just because they were the ones that uh, created the, the most uh, questions among market participants. And uh, the first set of field is the buyer and seller fields, and second is the decision maker. So when it comes to the buyer and seller field, uh, fields, um, just a, as a by way of introduction, uh, it should be uh, very important to keep in mind that um, MIFIR, uh, the focus of MIFIR is about the secondary market activity for the purpose of uh, market abuse surveillance. So what is it? It is interested from a regulatory perspective. Uh, it's not just the market-facing transactions, but it is a full chain of transactions. And uh, that um, is clearly um, indicated in the legal framework. In fact, Article 26 of MIFIR requires a transaction report to be made uh, where an investment firm executes a transaction. And the definition of what amounts to execution and what is a transaction are very broad. So, by execution, uh, we include also, amongst other activity, the, re the receipt and the transmission of an order. And a transaction is also def defined in a, broadly, in a broad way as the acquisition and disposal of a reportable financial instrument. So 
all this is just to um, keep in mind that in these uh, biostellar fields, uh, there will not only be populated the market par uh, counterparties, so the like market facing entities, but each and every uh, entity uh, that is uh, in the chain. Of course, this also provided that, um, that the entity is uh, subject to the reporting obligation. So it depends on, uh, on the status of the entity. Um, so uh, another important field is the decision maker field. Um, here, uh, this uh, set of fields is only applicable where the client is uh, making uh, is buying a financial instrument, but the investment decision is made under uh, the so-called power of representation. And uh, the uh, MIFIR guidelines that were published, uh, uh, well, the updated version was published in August this year, uh, they make clear that there are only few, there are two cases where uh, the decision maker uh, fields are relevant. And this is the case of the power of attorney arrangement. And secondly, the case of MIFID investment firm acting under a discretionary mandate. Uh, this second case is uh, definitely the one that generated more questions. And uh, the guidelines uh, make uh, several examples on uh, how these um, chains involving uh, firms acting under a discretionary mandate should be populated and reported to the regulators. So in the particular case of the fund, uh, the fund manager should be identified by the investment firm executing the order um, as the buyer or seller if the fund manager itself is not uh, registered as a MIFID investment firm. In case the fund manager was identified, uh, registered as a MIFID investment firm, he would have itself the reporting obligation and therefore uh, it would be uh, need to be identified in the um, decision maker field. So I see there is a question on, okay. Yes, well, you know, in all these cases, of course, uh, the uh, entities uh, that are identified in the buyer and seller and the decision maker fields should be identified with an LEI code. There are no alternative envisaged unless we are talking about natural persons. And therefore, uh, for instance, uh, a client that is a natural person or um, an, another entity that, uh, well, actually is only natural persons. So this, with respect to um, other entities to be identified in the MIFID report, uh, I would then move to the next uh, the, and the last uh, section of my presentation, that is the um, reporting scenarios. I have uh, pulled out a few scenarios from um, our uh, guidelines that were uh, originally published in October last year. Uh, and I've been focusing on the most uh, debated ones, uh, trying to bring a bit of clarity, especially with, with respect to the role of non-EU firms. However, I must uh, warn you that, uh, yes, our guidelines are very extensive and detailed. Uh, we're talking about 300 pages of uh, scenarios and clarifications. So I would uh, very much urge everybody to uh, study in detail the, uh, the guidelines themselves. Um, with respect to the scenarios that I have identified, uh, starting with the first one, uh, this is uh, a scenario where, which is already clear from Article uh, 26, Paragraph 5 of MIFIR, and uh, relates to the case of non-EU firms that are remotely accessing uh, EU trading venues as a member and participant, a participant of the trading venue. Uh, this case, uh, yes, is envisioned by Article 26.5 of MIFIR, and it has been further detailed with examples in our guidelines, the section 5.30 of our MIFIR guidelines. So, as you can see from the slides, uh, the, um, the gray color indicates uh, the lack of LEI, so um, where there is no obligation to obtain LEI under MIFID. And this is uh, in, in the two scenarios identified here. 
it's only applicable in the case where the non-EU firm is acting on its own account and is accessing the, directly the EU trading venue as a remote member. So uh, in the case where the non-EU firm is acting in any other capacity, the uh, underlying clients would also need to be identified with an LEI. And the uh, entity that is uh, responsible for the uh, reporting in this case would be the EU trading venue that is making, would make the report directly to the EU competent authorities. Uh, one clarification on the notion of trading venue, uh, we are here talking about also uh, the new, uh, so-called new MIFID II uh, trading venues, so also organized trading facility any entity that is bringing together uh, multiple buy and selling interests without committing its own capital uh, in the middle would be uh, potentially uh, qualifying as a trading venue uh, OTF. Um, for instance, uh, we are hearing uh, this could be the case of uh, some of the uh, EU inter brokers. So this is uh, to conclude on the first scenario. Uh, moving on to on the second scenario, um, this is the next slide, yes. So this scenario uh, concerns chains uh, or chains of transactions where uh, the firm is acting under a discretionary mandate for multiple clients. Again, this is something that is um, further detailed in our guidelines, in particular the section 5.27.1 of the MIFIR guidelines. And um, in the examples I have here, uh, I have indicated in gray the entities that do not need an LEI under MIFIR. So uh, we have here the case of a fund management firm that is not registered as a MIFIR 2 investment firm and is acting as a discretionary mandate uh, for two non EU clients. In this case, um, the reporting entity would be the EU investment firm, not the trading venue. Uh, the uh, fund management firm would not be a reporting entity because it's not registered as MIFI 2 investment firm. And consequently, the non-EU client would not be need to be identified with an LEI in the report. Um, in this case, could potentially also apply to uh, in the case where the fund management firm is a non-EU fund management firm. So it's, it covers all the cases where the firm is not registered as a MUFID investment firm. So moving on to the last scenario. Julia, Julia, can yeah. we just ask a question back on scenario two, please? Yeah. So can you can you contrast the MIFID requirement for scenario two with the EMIR requirement? That was exactly my next uh, slide. Sorry. Okay. Terrific. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I, there is no nice diagram on these slides, but uh, <laughs> this is uh, the exactly the mirror scenario when it comes uh, for for emir reporting. So this is the case where um, uh, an emir report has to be submitted for a transaction where a fund is involved. And uh, here the perspective is very different because uh, for the uh, EMIR reporting, um, given that also the purpose of the regulation is different and the data needed is different, uh, what uh, is interesting to see is the legal counterparty to the derivative contract, uh, which is subsequently cleared. So in order also to be able to follow the, all the post clearing activities on, on the position. So uh, in cases of transaction involving fund manager, what is uh, being cleared is um, always uh, the block, uh, is not the block trade that it is executed by the fund manager, but it is rather the allocations to the, to the clients. And uh, for that reason, uh, in these cases, uh, if the clients are considered to be the legal counterparty to the trade, they will need to be identified with an LEI. Uh, and this also applies for non-EU uh, clients because they would be uh, considered as like non-EU counterparty to be identified in the counterparty field. 
So as far um, as we know, there are only exceptional cases where the fund manager is executing the trade on its own account and is um, also allocating uh, after the T plus one reporting deadline. Normally the allocation occurs earlier. So uh, there are only exceptional cases where the fund manager is considered the legal counterparty and therefore should be identified in the report with an LEI. So there is a distinction between the EMIR and the MIFER requirement with, with this respect. Great. Great, Julia. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so being conscious of time, I just have two quick questions for you. Um, one, could you just re-clarify um, what happens if there's a lapsed LEI? So you'll, you'll accept um, lapsed LEIs for certain conditions. Um, and then just please specify who is actually rejecting the trade. Is it the competent authority? Um, if, that, if that is the correct answer. Yes. Uh, yes, that was uh, actually in one of my earlier slides uh, on the renewal. It was, yeah, no, before that. Well, uh, no, it's the front, next one. <laughs> Okay, never mind. So yes, the entities that are here you go. This one is the slide. So as I said at the beginning, all the requirements to have a, a valid, uh, duly renewed uh, LEI is only applicable to the uh, entity that is subject to the reporting obligations and to delegated reporting entity if the entity subject to the reporting obligation has delegated uh, its reporting. These two entities must both have a valid and duly renewed LEI. So the status of the, the, these LEIs should not be lapsed when the report is submitted to the TR in the case of EMIR and to the competent authorities in the case of uh, MIFIR. Uh, if the report contains uh, the LEI with a lapsed status, uh, that would trigger a rejection. So yes, the rejection will come from the competent authorities in the case of MIFIR and uh, from the trade repository uh, in the case of EMIR. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so, uh, so why don't we move on to the next um, section just again in the interest of time. Um, so, so we'd like to discuss um, with the LLUs who we have on the call. Oh, sorry, my apologies, thanks. <laughs> Um, we wanted to talk a little bit with the folks who are on the call from industry, Terry and Jim, uh, briefly. Terry and Jim, could you could you talk to the group a little bit about the readiness of the industry? Um, you know, how are folks going about, you know, getting LEIs or helping clients to get LEIs where they are needed? What um, what steps are being undertaken? Um, how is your firm, you know, planning to deal with uh, with the requirements? Sure, I, I could take a first stab at that, Terry, and, and jump in. Um, look, I think at a high level, obviously, there's a lot of work to do on all of our parts, um, you know, especially between now and the end of the year. As Robin mentioned earlier, we are seeing a big uptick in entities registering for LEIs, and I think that's a result of the collective community reaching out to clients, issuers, et cetera, of who require LEI. So we're obviously reaching out to clients. On the flip side, we see clients' counterparties reaching out to us. Um, you know, the, the big sell-side firms obviously have both ways where we're managing our own entities, making sure we're getting LEIs for all of our entities and funds, and also working with our clients who require them as well. So we're doing a lot of those outreaches. Our businesses are speaking to clients on it. Uh, we're making progress, still more to do. and um, you know, we feel good, but certainly not um, not done and a lot to do between now and the end of the year, as I mentioned. But Terry, if you want to add some points as well. Sure. Thanks, Jim. I think that this is an area where, as a U.S.-based um, attorney uh, in a global firm at, with Invesco, um, I, I do think that uh, what Julia was just talking about reflects how complicated it, the the approach to regulation is in Europe because there are so many different scenarios 
whereby parties access the market. And the easiest way to for a for a buy side firm and its clients to feel completely 100% secure is for every entity, every advisor and every client entity to have an LEI because then you know you're not going to have a gap. On the other hand, uh, when you have clients who are in the United States or, or not in Europe, maybe in Asia, and they think, well, I'm not, I, 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 why do I need an LEI? Why do I need the cost of it and, and the rest of, of the requirements? Admittedly, they're not, they're not extreme requirements, but why do I need to comply with that? Um, so it's, it's um, kind of a balance. I, I agree with Jim that it, it requires a, a lot of thoughtful contact with clients to make sure that they understand what what we as managers are doing and, and why and how they can help. I will also note for this audience that, that aside from MIFID and, and um, AMIR, there are some upcoming SEC requirements in the United States that will require LEIs uh, come, come um, next summer uh, for SEC reporting. So there are firms, I think, that are front-loading that and getting getting the entities that are going to need them for that reason anyway now. I think that may also help account for the uptick in, in volume. Uh, I think that you should think about your institutional separate account clients and situations where you as a manager are sub-advising another firm's product to make sure that you are uh, contacting all the right people to to understand who would be getting the LEI if you're doing it on their behalf and maintaining it because I think getting it and maintaining it um, can be challenging there and so I would encourage you all to think about that as you're as you're looking at your universe of accounts and clients. Terry thanks Jim thank you for that um, I think you know that the SEC point Terry was was useful and I, I would be remiss if I didn't remind people that you know under the CFTC rules um, you know, for swaps reporting, there is a regulatory mandate um, for the LEI. And, you know, for those of us who are subject to CFTC, um, oversight, uh, you know, they have, the CFTC has made its rounds uh, to institutions to check on compliance. So, um, so, you know, while the current big push is for, you know, MIFID and, and AMIR and MIFIR, um, I think people need to remember that you know the requirements for for organizations like the CFTC and 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 the SEC are also out there. We just saw an announcement from um, from India saying that they're going to be mandating LEIs for corporate clients. So so I think you know it's very important to to broadly think about your strategy for clients and the need to get an LEI beyond um, sort of this current push for January third because there are numerous rules out there that in fact mandate the, the LEI beyond um, and the fear and EMIR. So, so I think um, it's important. And, and folks can go to the Glyph website, glyph.org, and see the full list of all the rules that are out there um, for LEIs. And, and on that list, it, it specifies whether it's required or just requested. So, okay, so I, I'm gonna turn to the next section um, of the webinar. And uh, and we do have our colleagues, you know, on the call from the um, Irish Stock Exchange and, and the London Stock Exchange, the GMEI utility, and um, and so uh, I'd like to uh, pose a question to to the group there. And uh, could you guys please, you know, we we've heard about delays, and there's been a question that's come in um, through the webinar about delays in in getting an LEI. Could you talk a little bit about whether they are real and, and what's causing them? Hi, this, this is Eugene from the GMEI Utility, so I'll take that, you know, to start. So I'd say GMEI Utility, um, you know, as an organization, and I could certainly speak probably for the others and the, and the others that lose on the call will probably echo my sentiment. So we're mature organizations. We've seen this regulatory run-up before. We're preparing for it, and, you know, we're continuing to get prepared for it, but it's it's volume. So if we talk about just a simple example, last year the system did 70,000 LEIs for the entirety of the year. So if we're talking volumes in the range of a million to two million LEIs in the next couple of months, 
that's a lot of volume. So we're prepared as best as we can, but I think firms should understand that getting an LEI is not you know, as simple as getting a number issued. There's a process and it's prescribed by GLIFE. So the entities have to apply for it. The data has to be vetted and validated before um, the LEIs are issued. I think I could also speak to the level two data aspect of the record. So the, with the addition of level two data with the record, the record has become more complex. So I'd say, you know, broadly, you know, the loot is prepared and we're, we're ready for the volume. But again, volume in a compressed time frame and additional complexity uh, adds up to just a lot of volume. This is um, Prasar from the London Stock Exchange. Um, within the industry, there is still a lack of understanding of the benefit and the use of the LEI. Many still consider the LEI to be a new code and therefore the adoption of LEI has been a lot slower than we would have expected. Um, at the moment, the use of the LEI is mandated by regulation and in most cases, unless the firms or the applicants have an understanding of the reporting requirements that use the LEI. Um, obtaining the LEI in most cases tends to be a reactive process rather than a proactive process, which um, as a consequence results in delays. Um, an example or a good example of this would be particularly the Asian market and non-EU areas where we have seen um, as LOUs as a whole that those areas are slow to adopt the LEI and potentially many don't actually understand that the LEI is needed in some instances. This is Breed Klein from the Irish Stock Exchange. Uh, to follow on from Eugene and Preetha's points, uh, the 2018 MIFID II deadline, uh, it took away from the sense of urgency around the LEI code and as a result, uh, we saw applications having a more relaxed approach. Um, by not taking act action as quickly as we would have hoped. Um, in parallel to that, the introduction of the, uh, the level two requirements certainly added to the workload, which resulted in applicants waiting for the first movers in the industry, thus causing some delays. So, so I guess just back to the direct question, um, are you, what is the current turnaround time for the LEI uh, issuance at this point that you're experiencing? This is Chris again from the London Stock Exchange. Um, I, can, I, I believe I can speak on behalf of um, all LOUs, particularly ones on this call. We have all staffed up significantly and we are ready for increased volumes. Um, but just to reiterate Eugene's point that he mentioned earlier regarding the figures, there will be um, systemic capacity issues if everybody waits till the last moment to get their LEI because of the process to follow to actually obtain the LEI and issue the LEI. Okay, well, let me try it this a different way. Um, so to the extent that, you know, a registrant is experiencing delays or in anticipation of delays, and volume, as we as we noted at the beginning of the webinar, right? We saw 5,000 come through in, in a day. Um, what can registrants do to, you know, sort of facilitate the process or expedite the process? I'll take that one. It's Breed from the R Stock Exchange. Um, I would say the best thing applicants can do is make sure that they're giving us a good, clean application, make sure that they're providing us with all the correct information. That would cut down on a lot of the back and forth, uh, you know, in communication that we would have to do um, to try and get the application complete and get the LEI out. Um, that's, I'd say, one of the biggest things that slows us down. The, the, the cleaner the application, the quicker the process on our side and the quicker you'll get an LEI. And just for my own uh, edification, what particular data element is causing uh, a challenge? So if, if you're, you're saying that to be prepared with, with complete and accurate information um, in the application is essential, you know, what part of that application is the one that, that's uh, causing additional either research or, or processing? 
This is Eugene from Jimmy I Utility. So I'll take that again. I, th I think that, again, there's certainly prescribed fields within the records. It's the ISO 17442 standard. So there's certain values that are enumerated. There are certain values that are required. So I think there's, again, I think there's enforcement on the capture of that information across the system. Again, the level two information added an additional complexity to the record. So that aside, again, I, I, I know we'll say that it would be ideal if that legal entity and the ultimate and direct and parents had LEIs, that'd make our lives easy, but we're not there yet. But just the designation of a parent and the research with respect to, you know, authoritative sources to that um, consolidated financials to those standards, it's it's a, a broad expanse from the level one record. So good, clean data would be all fields filled out, business registry, LEI is designating direct and ultimate parent. That would be a dream case, but you know, again, we're not there yet with the system continuing to evolve. Okay, so um, so I guess the, I'm still getting a couple questions coming through to you guys. How long does it take? To, um, to turn around an LEI right now? Can someone please just answer that question uh, as to the time frame? This is Eugene, I'll, I'll, I'll take it again. So I don't think we're trying to be evasive. I think as clients look at their record sets and clients come to the various loos with broad data sets, I think it could vary. We all have SLAs, or at least we try and keep them as SLAs as possible. And we always make the caveat, volume dependent. Again, it's a, it's a system of capacity. Um, so everybody has staffed up. We've done everything we possibly could you know, to be there. But if clients are assessing broad data sets and you know, a client comes to any one particular loo and they're gonna say, I'm just gonna make all my clients compliant and they're gonna come in with tens of thousands of LEIs, there's, you know, there will be some slippage in, in SLAs, but I, I think that everybody's striving to, you know, to keep it as minimum as possible. But um, you know, I think that some of the messaging will just be come as early as possible ahead of the you know the, the deadline. Okay. Um, all right. So thanks for that. I think the the key message coming here to to folks on the phone is, um, you know, if you're working with your clients or for yourselves or whomever, is that you really just need to to start your work now. Um, you know, to the extent that, you know, people are responding on the chat that, you know, we're seeing weeks of delays. Um, that just means you need to get started now and apply for the LEIs so that we're prepared in advance of January 3rd. So thank you to all of the panelists for this section um, of the webinar. We do want to turn now to the next section, um, which is going to be an update from the GLIFE. Claire Rowley um, from, from the GLIF. Claire is the head of business operations there. It's going to update us on a number of important items. Um, we are going to actually do another quick poll um, in order to you know, sort of get an idea from folks on the call. Another challenge question um, that has to do with um, you know, what kind of organizational you know, challenges are folks experiencing and complying in particular with the new level two requirements. So Will, do you want to read the questions again like you did last time? Sure. Uh, what challenges is your organization, it should be our, your, I, I don't know, experiencing and complying with new level two requirements? Uh, select all that apply so you don't have to just click one. Requirements unclear as to who is the immediate ultimate parent. Can an identify or cannot identify immediate and or ultimate parent? parent, <laughs> difficulty in providing documentation requested by LOUs, or the best answer, uh, if I was responding, no challenges, um, or I wish I could, could say no challenges. So uh, uh, votes are coming in. We've got about 30% in. I know that, that we had some slides, so folks took their eye off their, their uh, webinar window. If you could look back at the webinar and just uh, click on the screen. Um, one of your, uh, if, you, if you're having any challenges or if you want to report no challenges, that'd be great as well. Um, we're up to 34%. I think I'm going to wait until we hit 50 uh, we, or perhaps 45. 
I see the votes rolling in now. I wish I had um, uh, hold music. We're up to 40%. You just uh, cast your vote. Your vote counts. Um, all right, gonna hit 45 and close. Interesting uh, results here. Gonna close now uh, and gonna share the results. So what challenges is your organization experiencing in complying with the new LEI or level two requirements? This is the hierarchy uh, parent, ultimate parent requirements. Um, requirements unclear as to who is immediate ultimate parent. 54% of the, uh, the persons who completed this poll indicated that as a challenge. Can I identify immediate and or ultimate parent? 50, well, 49%. Legal obstacles to providing the information may exist, 27%. Difficulty in providing documentation requested by LOUs, that's also 27%. And the lucky 19% that have no challenges. So this is some interesting feedback. I, I'll turn it, Robin, any commentary or... Uh, no, I think that um, that it's interesting and, and informative, um, and I think you know to the extent that folks have questions as to requirements, that's why we have you know Claire on the on the call today to to run through some of that for us. Um, and again, I would just refer people to the leirock.org website to actually look at the guidance that is there from the regulators with respect to um, the immediate and ultimate parents that, that could be helpful as well. So Claire, we're gonna turn it over to you now and ask you to uh, give us an update on the level two and, and then the other topics on, uh, on the agenda for you. Thank you, Robin. And good morning, good afternoon to all participants. It's a pleasure to be here with you and discuss a bit broader some activities that are going on in the global LEI system. Of course, with MIFID II um, and other deadlines, as Julia mentioned, upcoming, there is quite a push to get the LEI, to have those LEIs issued and renewed, but we like to make you aware of some other important activities going on in the global LEI system. A uh, perfect segue from the poll is starting on page two here, a short overview of our level two data collection. So this is information on the direct and ultimate parent. This data collection started in May of 2017. It will uh, slowly populate over the course of one year. So all legal entities are required to provide information on direct and ultimate parent either at the time of new LEI issuance or existing LEI renewal. So for that reason, it will take until about the first half of 2018 before we have a full population of information. Based on the results we just saw from the poll, there is some growing pains here as organizations become familiar. As we heard from the LOU organizations, um, it is the first time that many clients are having to provide this information. Uh, as Robin mentioned, there is information available both on the LEI ROC as well as the GLIFE website, but a very important and useful piece of information is the individual LOU website where there is user guides that help to walk you through the process. So in order to avoid delays, I do encourage take a few minutes take a look in particular at the user guide that's available and hopefully that will avoid any confusion um, and make it a bit more clear especially the supporting documentation that is required moving to the next page i'll talk a little bit more about the level two data collection to date from a system perspective so we the glyph publish a quarterly report on the global lei system Starting in second quarter of this year, we incorporated statistics on the level two data. You'll see here a snapshot of the opening page related to level two data collection. It will shortly be updated uh, just at the beginning of November with our Q3 report. But what I'd like to do now is simply give you an understanding of how to interpret this. And hopefully you find it as a useful resource to understand what is going on with this data collection and also the type of information that is being provided. 
So as of end of second quarter 2017, we had just over 56,000 legal entities that reported level two data. This was only 11% of the total active LEIs. The count will about triple um, as we go into our quarter close in Q3 and are refreshing the report. So again, I like to emphasize this information will be populated over the course of a year as we have legal entities coming into the system or renewing, but we give you a bit of insight onto those preliminary results. So if you move to the next page, you will see here a close-up of the two boxes that were on the previous page at the bottom. So the report itself will give you some information on the ultimate reporting and on the direct parent reporting. Specifically, you will see the nature of information coming from the legal entities. So we have four categories here. The first is the legal entity that reports a direct or ultimate parent having an LEI. That is the most insightful from a user perspective because then the user of the LEI data will be able to clearly identify all information associated with the child as well as the parents. The second category we have is legal entities that report a direct or ultimate parent, but unfortunately that direct or ultimate parent does not yet have an LEI. Today in the global LEI system, there is a data collection associated with that. However, it is only shared today with the regulators uh, as the regulators are trying to understand what is the nature of these entities without LEIs and should this information ultimately be published. Our next category are those legal entities reporting that they have no direct parent according to the definition used. And for the direct and ultimate parent reporting, there is an accounting consolidation standard. So for those legal entities that may have experienced the registration process, you would have been had three options if you were indeed in the case of having no direct parent according to the definition used, and this would be natural persons, non-consolidating, or no known person. And then our last category, which is the category uh, with no information really available, would be illegal entities that cite obstacles, legal obstacles that prevent them from providing or publishing direct parent information. And you can see below that box, there are five possible options that a legal entity could indicate when registering for that LEI if it fell in this category. So the good news is that we have very few legal entities so far that are opting out. That indicates that the global LEI system is getting in information and over the course of this year we are working with stakeholders and users of the data to understand their assessment of this information. I'll now move on to some of the other topics beyond our direct and ultimate parent reporting and I will start with branches on page five. So the global LEI system is also expanding its data collection to include international branches. The LEI ROC put forth a policy inclusive of reporting for international branches about uh, one year ago. The GLIFE then developed the technical standards and with the LOUs is currently putting that into operation. So branch reporting has two components for our level one data. There is a new data element that will allow the user to identify is this legal entity an international branch and then additionally there is a relationship record collection um, in this case rather than having a direct and ultimate parent there is a head office one unique aspect of this reporting is that it is the head office that registers its branches currently the global lei system is growing to incorporate this reporting all lous are expected to implement the protocol by march of 2018 I'd like to also then move into some other projects focusing on the LEI as a bridging identifier. We have two projects ongoing, one with SWIFT and one with ANA, and the goal here is to leverage the LEI as an open and global identifier and allow users to more easily connect to other identification systems that are common in financial 
transactions or for regulatory reporting. So Glyph and Swift are collaborating to publish a BIC to LEI mapping table. You will see on this slide four of the deliverables involved. And where we are focusing now would be on the publication. So the last one, communications and then go live, which we are focusing for in fourth quarter of this year. On the next page, you will see a brief overview of some of Glyph's collaboration with Anna, um, and specifically looking to ma map the LEI to the ISIN issuer. My apologies, there's a typo there on the slide. So currently we are working with the Honor Secretariat and three pilot LOUs to develop two work streams, one technical and one operational. And the goal here is to understand, is there a way to, from an algorithmic perspective, map the LEI to the ISIN issuer? And then separately from an operational perspective, is there procedures or protocols that national numbering agencies could follow to validate and associate the LEI to the ISIN issuer at the time of the ISIN issuance? So currently we are working through these two work streams um, and we'll report back later in the year um, relative to those results. It is important to note, I think, that many of or some of the NNAs are already LEI issuers, so hopefully that will help with the consistency. Um, of the procedures. Hey, Claire, can I interrupt you just for a moment there? Um, once you complete the work and the pilot, um, what is the rollout plan, so to speak, for these mapping tables? Indeed, so it, it does, um, so relative to the BIC to LEI mapping, which was the previous, we do aim to publish a table until the end of this year. So that would be conclusive this year relative to the partnership with ANA that would depend on the conclusion of the pilots, both the technical and the operational work stream. Uh, we will conclude those pilots this year and then we'll be able to give a bit more insight into how we move forward with that. So with that one, I can't really give um, any estimation at the moment. But, you know, conceptually, the intention is to make these mapping tables available through the GLIFE site for free as authoritative sources of the mapping. Indeed, that, that is the goal would be to give the uh, simple pair. So in the case of the BIC to LEI, this pair of the two identifiers uh, freely available, similar to the LEI data on the Glyph website. Thank you. Thank you. And then I will move to the last topic here which is an, a notification of a public consultation that was recently issued by our LEI ROC. So in September of this year, the LEI ROC published a consultation document on funds. Currently within the global LEI system, there is already a data collection associated with the concept of fund family. Um, and specifically two types of associated entities, an umbrella fund and an entity managing a fund. However, the LEI ROC would like to achieve two things with this consultation. First, to ensure consistent implementation of relationship data throughout the global LEI system. And second, provide a means to facilitate a standard, standardized collection of fund relationship information at the global level. So the consultation itself has seven sections. Uh, the, it introduces a different types of funds that you will see here noted in point four on the slide. It then poses questions related to when should a fund be represented by an LEI, the extent to which fund relationships should be required within the global LEI system, the verifications that should be conducted by the LOUs relative to fund relationships, representation from a technical standpoint of fund relationships in the global LEI system, and then any additional information that users might have on other fund relationships. So we do encourage um, all participants, please do take a look at this. The LEI ROC is welcoming feedback until 26th of November. And that brings me to a conclusion of my update. Thank you, uh, Claire, very much for that. Um, I would encourage people to take a look, uh, especially since we had such a large representation from the buy side um, for this call today, 
I would encourage folks to take a look at that ROC consultation on fund relationships. They are seeking um, expert feedback from the industry. Uh, we are working through the SIFMA Asset Management Group to respond to that consultation. So anyone who is participating in that, um, please, you know, uh, join join the call and um, and and give us your feedback. So. Um, Claire, just there, there were actually interesting were interestingly were several questions that came in over the course of the webinar relating to natural people. Um, would you mind just taking a brief second and um, and just maybe describing for for folks the actual requirements for natural people and uh, you know versus sort of people in in a business capacity? Certainly. So the global LEI system is envisioned to allow for LEI issuance to individuals acting in a business capacity. So this could be, for example, a sole trader, a sole proprietorship, but an, an individual that is registered in some sort of official local registration authority as having a business capacity. It is not intended for natural persons um, alone. Also, Julia mentioned earlier in her presentation relative to MIFID II where the, the requirements to report with an LEI do indeed stop at that line of a natural person. So it is it is quite a, a bright line between individuals acting in a business capacity, which are eligible for an LEI versus natural persons. Great, thank you, thank you for that. And then actually um, one other question, interesting question just came in that would be worthy to answer, I think, um, either Claire from you or the LOUs. The question had to do with, you know, what happens um, if you an entity gets two LEIs based on registering in two different uh, uh, LOUs? So there is a check for duplicate procedure that is carried out by the LOU at the time of the LEI issuance. And then um, indeed the GLIFE does uh, review from time to time to ensure that there is not duplicates issued. But if there is such a case that occurs, one LEI would be recognized as being a duplicate and then also mapped to the successor LEI so that always from a user of the system, you would be able to understand what was the, what, what is the successor LEI or the living LEI that is associated with that duplicate. Okay, great. So, so there are a number of other questions that have come in through the Q and A. Um, we, from the last two webinars we've done with CIFMA, CIFMA and GFMA, we have responded to those questions and published them. We will intend to do that again. Um, what I found myself writing back to the group through the Q&A no, numerous times was further questions um, on the ESMA guidance um, with respect to you know, which counterparties and which um, firms need LEI. Um, I think, you know, importantly, right, Julia made us well aware of um, the Article 26 in Mathir that lays out scenarios and, and sections 5.27 and 5.30 of the guidelines on transaction reporting. I would encourage people to have a look at those scenarios. They're, I have looked at them myself. You know, they do attempt to, to give guidance for, you know, questions like the questions that have been coming in through the Q&A and will work to also provide some feedback, you know, through the, through the Q&A process. So I just want to thank everybody. Um, it is 9 o'clock. We're going to end the call. Thank everybody for attending. Thank our panelists for um, the great presentations. And um, wish everybody a very good day and evening. Thank you, everyone.